Good morning, everyone, and today we're going to be going over our last simple machine. Well, we'll talk about another one next semester, probably, but the wheel and axle. Um, this has been used to provide mechanical, this, uh, mechanical advantage in two different ways. Uh, as you can see in the image here, we have people pushing around um, on a, a ship to raise the anchor. They're raising the anchor have a lot of people pushing around in a circle, but it's turning something that is much smaller on the inside, right? So uh, the idea of mechanical advantage can be applied to a wheel and axle, but really a wheel and axle system is almost exactly the same as the lever, okay? It's basically the lever system. The same kind of calculation is put into effect, okay? So fantastic. First thing we need to know is some basic vocabulary about circles. Um, if you take a look here, you need to know that uh, the different parts and pieces, specifically, the radius is the distance from the center of the circle to the outside of the circle. That's our radius. The diameter is the distance across the circle that it has to pass through the center. Um, some people think that this is also a diameter. This is not a diameter because it does not pass through the center of the circle. If anyone, um, if anyone knows what that's called, make sure somebody gives them a high five. Um, it is called a chord, by the way. So diameter goes across the circle but passes through the center. Um, so that that's. Uh, this distance, and the diameter is always two times the radius. So if your radius, remember if I were to rotate this radius down, it would be exactly half. Uh, you also have the distance all the way around the circle. This is kind of like the perimeter of the circle, and that's called your circumference. So when we're dealing with wheel and axles, we have all of these things that we have to take into consideration. Um, the circumference, and with a wheel, the circumference of the wheel determines how far you travel. So if this was hooked up to a car and you started right here and you lay that out, um, it's going to be, it would be a line, okay? If this wheel rotated one full rotation, the line or the distance that the wheel would have traveled is gonna be whatever the diameter is times 3.14 or pi, okay? So if you wanna know how far that wheel rolls on the ground, it's always the diameter times pi. That's our circumference or the perimeter of the circle. Cool. Hopefully that was helpful. Please feel free to pause at any time if you need to ask further questions for clarification. Let's go over some basic definitions next. Uh, make sure you guys know which one's which. It's, it's a, the wheel and axle is a system consisting of two circular cylindrical objects which are fastened together rigidly and rotate around a common axis. This machine is primarily used to magnify a torque um, supplied by the user. So put simply, the only word in there that might need some clarification, and we'll go over this in just a minute, is torque. Okay, torque is basically the circular version of leverage. It's when you apply a force to a circular object it is uh, the amount of force that can be measured in the system. Now, torque is an important concept for an engineer. When you think about certain things being rotated, sometimes things that are being turned and have a torque applied to them can cause twisting and deformation of an object. Think about like an Allen wrench or a hex key. Hopefully all of you guys have seen one of those. Sometimes when you, when you take an Allen, Allen key um, and you use it over a long period of time, this end of the Allen key starts to kind of twist and bow and like it starts to kind of deform and you no longer have this straight key that you're used to using. You have this kind of messed up thing going on. So that's a torque applied to the system. And it's an analysis that uh, an engineer would come and, and do. So make sure you have it. It is a simple machine consisting of two circular cylindrical objects fastened together and rotate around a common axis. That's also important. It's possible to have them um, rotate differently. Like you could have the wheel centered somewhere else on this one. The machine is primarily used to magnify a torque. Perfect. So 
pause at any time. But I'll go back. So it turns out that there's two situations with a wheel and axle uh, for calculating mechanical advantage. You only have to draw this picture once. Okay, so draw this once, and then you're going to draw kind of an arrow on your paper. And one's going to go off to the left, one's going to go off to the right. We're going to talk about the two situations in which we use a wheel and axle. The first situation is if the input force is applied to the big wheel. So if you are turning the bigger wheel, it turns out you're applying this. Well, first of all, when you turn the wheel on the axle, if you mark a spot on, let's go over this right now. You mark a spot on the wheel on the axle. When I do one rotation, of the big wheel, the small wheel will also do one full rotation. Um, so they're rotating the same, so it doesn't seem like much is different. However, if I were rotating this wheel with a force of, let's say, 10 pounds, and you wanted to stop the rotation by grabbing the axle, it would be very, very difficult. Um, so basically, in this situation, when you're applying a force to the outside, uh, it's, you're using less force at a greater distance to create more for force at a smaller distance and a slower speed. So the kind of mechanical advantage presented here is just like the one that was in the image at the beginning slide. We have people pushing at a greater distance away from the point of rotation, just like a lever. Okay, If you're away at the end of a lever, you're going to have more uh, mechanical advantage, basically. So you have people pushing at the far, farther distance away, rotating something that's smaller, and they need to wind up this big, heavy anchor that probably weighs thousands of pounds. So all these guys working together, you create more force at a shorter distance. You have to walk farther than this is rotating, but it turns out to be a lot easier to get the job done. Okay, so to find this mechanical advantage, if you haven't already noticed, this says M-A-I which is ideal. It's the ideal mechanical advantage. Remember, friction and other things get in the way, but the ideal mechanical advantage is whatever the big radius of the circle is divided by whatever the small radius is of the circle. And it turns out, so fairly easy to calculate, but it turns out that um, this isn't that hard to calculate with the diameter. It doesn't matter, you could use the diameter. If you'd use the diameter of the big circle and divide by the diameter of the small circle, it's still the same thing because the diameter is just the radius times two. So we just scaled this up. That is an equivalent ratio. You can use the diameter to calculate it. You can use the radius to calculate it. And since the diameter times pi is the circumference, you could also use the circumference of the big circle divided by the circumference of the small circle. But for today's lesson and for your assignment, assignment, it's going to make the most sense to probably use diameter for your measurements. You'll be using the meter sticks and uh, tape measures in the back of the classroom. Um, and yeah, perfect. Okay, that's the first situation when you have the force applied to the outside. In this situation, when you're applying the force to the outside, you're creating a greater force on the inside. So the most the point here is to create a greater force, and that's important to be able to analyze these systems. Situation two is when the input force is applied to the axle or the small wheel. If you're applying a force to this axle, basically what you're doing is, remember, this is turning the same right here, but you're converting a greater force applied to this system to a... A wheel that is larger. So every time this rotates once, this is rotating once. However, it's going a much greater distance and therefore you're getting a greater speed when you are rotating. So if the input force is applied to the small wheel, so situation two, again, you don't have to draw this picture again. If the force is applied to the small wheel, then you do the input radius basically divided by the output. So the force is going into this system, this divided by the big radius. In this case, so let me go back real fast. In this case, you're always going to get a mechanical advantage that is going to be greater than 1 because the radius of the big circle is bigger than the radius of the small circle. 
in this case, when you do little radius divided by big radius, or rather, if you do little diameter divided by big diameter, or little circumference divided by little circumference, uh, big circumference, you're always going to get a mechanical advantage that is less than one. So what that means is you are sacrificing your force. You have to put in more force, but you get a greater speed and a greater distance applied to the system. An example of this, you guys may have already thought of some. Feel free to pause and share uh, each situation. So it's a situation two with a mechanical advantage less than one. Uh, the perfect example would be like a car. Okay, You're applying force. Think about the axle uh, or a bicycle. You're applying force to um, a sprocket on the back tire of your bicycle. Okay, And every time that sprocket rotates one time, it rotates your tire one time, but your tire's on the ground. So you have to rotate this tiny distance with your feet, and it gets the tire to rotate this great distance, which pushes you a great distance and at a faster speed. You're going at a faster speed because you're trading off more force put into the smaller circle for a greater speed and distance on the larger one. Here we go. Let's take a look at this situation here. Is this going to be a mechanical advantage greater than one or less than one? When you grab the doorknob, the input force is being applied to this great big circle, which means in this case, let's say this was, assuming that's a diameter, and this one, I'm going to say the diameter is right there. Let's say here the diameter is, I don't know, let's take a guess, 7 centimeters, and here the diameter is... 2.8 centimeters. To calculate your mechanical advantage, you always do the diameter where the input force is. This is for just the wheel and axle system, right? Mechanical advantage is going to be the diameter of the input force, which is 7, divided by the diameter of the output force, which is 2.8. And I don't necessarily have a calculator with me. Who knows? That's okay. We can pull one out. Um, and so you're going to get one a mechanical advantage that is less than one in this case. So it's going to be, the calculator comes out of budget sometimes too. Oh dear heavens. All right, let's do this the hard way. There we go. So you would come over here, do 7 divided by 2.8. Excuse me, 2.5. Cool. So we get a mechanical advantage of 2.5. So what does that mean? Mechanical advantage of 2.5 means to us that um, basically when I turn this, I'm getting two and a half times the force in the system of my axle, um, but it's not rotating as fast. Big deal. Next one. We're not going to do this for this much detail for everyone. So. Again, car axle. you got something that's turning the axle of your car. Every time this turns once, these are turning once, but they're going a much further distance than the circumference of this circle. So in this case, you have a input force, 7 divided by 2.8. So in this case, you're going to have a mechanical advantage that is less than 1. You're sacrificing force to get speed and distance. You're getting a larger distance being applied in the system. Okay, how about this one here? This is an old blacksmith's wheel. Now, a blacksmith, this has a lot of physics going on. You have to keep the momentum of the wheel going. People would crank this, but you're cranking, and the, the wheel is turning at a greater distance. So you're sacrificing force to get a greater distance and speed out here so you could sharpen an axe or a sword or whatever was going on at the time. So this is going to have a mechanical advantage that is less than 1. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Okay? It doesn't necessarily be bad mechanical advantage. You're just using the tool differently. You're inputting more force to get a greater speed and distance, less than 1. Okay, how about a screwdriver? Your input diameter is right here, and that is going to be greater than output diameter. 
So you would measure these. In this case, your mechanical advantage is going to be, what is it? Greater than one. Yeah. Greater than one. You have more leverage in the system. So, yeah, perfect. And lastly, the whisk. You're applying your force to the diameter here, and the output force is the diameter there. So in this case, you're sacrificing force for speed, just like kind of like the broom when we're talking about leverages, right? And in this case, your mechanical advantage is less than one. Okay, let's go over some vocabulary really quickly. Torque uh, is the result. I always think of this picture of like the result of applying linear force at the outside of a circular frame to create a turning tendency. Um, and so uh, in this case, the outside of the circular frame would be the back sprocket, and it's creating a turning tendency uh, that is unbelievably powerful going to that tire. And so you can calculate mechanical magnitude. But it turns out there's a huge complicated system inside this motorcycle. It's not as simple as just the back sprocket getting turned. If you're just looking at the back, then that's what's happening. But and you also have um, you know, the crankshaft and the engine and everything else turning other sprockets that are connected. And we'll do a calculation with that in just a minute. There's your torque. Um, you also need to remember RPM revolutions per minute is how many times that uh, crankshaft is rotating in your engine. Um, if you look on the dial of a car, it'll say 1,000, 2,000, 3, or 1, 2, 3. But it says RPMs time 1,000. So if the bar is up here at 3, it means it's really going 3,000 times per minute. So if you do a quick calculation, 3,000 rotations. Let's do the other. 3,000 rotations in one minute. is the same as 3,000 rotations in 60 seconds. And if you simplify this, cancel a zero, 300 divided by 250 divided by three. So you're really rotating 50 rotations per one second. So 50 rotations per second is happening if you are at 3,000 RPMs. That's pretty fast. Um, yeah, so it turns out that you can use mechanical advantage as well to talk about how rotations are changing. Now that's not very useful in the systems that we've seen, because anytime I rotate the handle once, I rotate the stem of my screwdriver once. Okay, so not super helpful. Um, I just want you guys to know that RPM stands for revolutions or rotations per minute. So let's go on and take a look at another system that a wheel and axle can be applied commonly you see these things called belt drives or chain drives. And you have two wheels here working together. A lot of these, the, a lot of the times these have gears connected. Um, this can be also called like a gear ratio in a lot of times, but there's no gears here. This is just a regular old belt drive. And you have to be careful because the mechanical advantage of a belt drive is calculated slightly differently than it is um, before. Before we always did the input force divided by the output, and with a belt drive, it's different. If you are applying a force to the outside of this belt, if the force is turning this wheel here, then um, this is turning at a greater speed. These two wheels are not turning the same number of revolutions. If the diameter of this wheel is three times the diameter of this wheel, that means when this wheel rotates one whole revolution around like this. This wheel has rotated one, two, three revolutions. So what you end up happening here, what ha ends up happening here is, uh, oh, oh, also vice versa. If you, if you were to apply force to this side here and you wanted to calculate um, the number of revolutions, if this thing is turning when this thing turns once, this is going to do a third of a revolution, assuming that the relationship is actually three. So to calculate the mechanical advantage, you, you just do the diameter of the output. Okay. So we'll call this, for the sake of this, I think this is more interesting, 
we'll call this the input force. We're applying input, the force to this wheel, and that makes this our output. And you'll have to, we'll talk about that in just a minute. If you're doing this calculation, let's say that this diameter is uh, 10, no, 12. Let's say that this is 12 inches, and the diameter of the center circle is 4, or the small one. So the diameter of the output is 4, the diameter of the input is 12. So in this case, we get a mechanical advantage that is less than 1. We are sacrificing distance for speed, similar to what we were doing before. So this ends up being a mechanical advantage of one third or 0 0.33. It's less than 1, right? Okay, so this is kind of opposite of what we had before. Before it was, if the input force was on the outside, the input input always went on top. When it, with a belt drive or a chain drive, the mechanical advantage is backwards. So just keep that in mind. Let's take a look at a bicycle. This is a compound wheel and axle system. You actually have three separate systems. You have system A, System A is the interaction of the pedals turning the front sprocket. System B is the front sprocket turning the back sprocket. And System C is the back sprocket driving the back wheel. So a bicycle, and this is an old fixie bike, there's only one gear on the front and back wheel. This is basically where you take hundreds of years of bicycle knowledge and just throw that out the window. But it's easier for my example. Um, we need to calculate the mechanical advantage of the system. So first, let's go over the diameters of the things that we need to know. I'm going to say that the diameter of between the pedal, where the, the centers of the pedals, where they're attached, I'm going to say that's 9 inches. Okay, And the diameter of this, we'll call that, well, I don't know, the diameter of the center circle, we'll call that 5 inches. And the diameter of the back sprocket, we could call that diameter back here, uh, let's say that's 2 inches, that's 9, and then we'll say the diameter of the yellow one, if you guys can see that, that diameter, we'll call that 20. All right, so if we want to calculate the mechanical advantage of this system, and for system A, is the relationship between the pedals to the sprocket. So let's first calculate the mechanical advantage of system A. Again, that's the relationship between the pedals turning the front sprocket. So to do that, this is a regular old wheel and axle system. So you just do the input diameter divided by the output diameter. And this one's going to give us a mechanical advantage that is greater than 1. So that's 9 over 5. Super. Which is, what, 1.8? Okay. That gives us a mechanical advantage of 1.8. Now let's take a look at system B. System B is we have a force being applied from this gear to that gear. Now we have to be careful here because... This isn't a regular wheel and axle system. The relationship between this and this is a belt drive or a chain drive. So what we have to do here is we have to do the mechanical advantage of system B, which is the two gears, the front sprocket and the back sprocket. You do the diameter of the output divided by the diameter of the input force, which is 5. 2 fifths gives us a mechanical advantage of 0.4. Okay, and then lastly, calculating the mechanical advantage of system C. System C is the relationship of the back sprocket to the tire, and so that's a regular old wheel and axle system. So you do the input for or the input diameter force is going. First from your pedals to here, then from the front sprocket to your back, the back sprocket, and then from the back sprocket to the big wheel. So the input force is the small divided by the large, which is one-tenth, which is 0 0.1. Okay, so to calculate the total mechanical advantage, K 
mechanical advantage total is equal to the mechanical advantage of system A times, this is a compound system, the mechanical advantage of system B times the mechanical advantage of system C. So what ends up happening here is you just plug in these numbers. It's pretty easy. 1.8 times 0 0.4 times 0 0.1. Let's go to my calculator and do that real fast. So we do 1.8 times 0 0.4 times 0 0.1, 0 0.072. So if I come down here and I do 0 0.072, which means, this should make sense, in this situation, we are sacrificing a greater distance, okay? We're sacrificing, or we're, we're pushing these pedals and we're sacrificing force, pushing them to get a force, and then that force is um, being turned into a greater distance. So we're applying more force at a shorter distance to get um, a faster speed and a greater distance in our bicycle overall. And there's our mechanical advantage calculation. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So as you gear these up, I mean, this is with a really small gear. If this had a greater gear on the back, that greater gear would make this a larger number, which would give us more mechanical advantage to the system. So that's pretty cool. I think. All right, so that's how you calculate mechanical advantage of a bike. I think that's my last slide. Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, in today's lesson, you're going to be calculating mechanical advantage and thinking about force, distance, and speed. Hope you guys have a great day. Great. Perfect. All right. Let's do it.